It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of self-reliance. An Economy of One with Gary Rathbun. This is our country. Good evening and welcome again to An Economy of One. I am your host, Gary Rathbun. We're going to get right into this. Uh, been looking forward to uh, my guest all day. I'm speaking with Ilya Shapiro. He's a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute and editor-in-chief of Cato Supreme Court Review. He's a former special assistant advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues, and he's provided testimony to Congress and state legislators as coordinator of Cato's amicus brief program, filed more than 100 friend of the court briefs in the Supreme Court. Ilya, welcome to An Economy of One. Good to be on. Hey, uh, before we get started, it's my understanding that uh, you and your wife are adding to uh, future taxpayers to help pay my uh, Social Security going forward. Is that correct? Uh, we just did. He, he <laughs> turns a month tomorrow. Excellent. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That's a big change in your life, first one? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Um, it's surreal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never had children, so uh, I, I do not know of what I speak. But uh, I, I got to believe that having children is the ultimate um, optimistic attitude for our country going forward. So being a constitutional expert, uh, I'm assuming you have some, uh, some positive uh, optimistic views for, for our Constitution going forward. Well, I have positive views about the state of uh, my wife and my union. <laughs> That's the important part. Hey, I wanted to talk to you. I, I read a couple articles that you put together recently uh, from the Cato Institute talking about the case that the uh, Supreme Court has agreed to hear uh, regarding uh, some teachers out in California and uh, essentially uh, being charged, uh, I don't think it's union dues, but it's uh, agency fees. Um, and uh, the teachers are, are challenging that uh, under free speech laws. Right. This is, uh, it's, it's not uh, simply that the court agreed to hear it. They, they heard the case. It was argued last month, so oh, we're okay. waiting for an opinion. Probably it'll come in June at the end of the term. Mm -hmm. um, so the issue is this. In about half the states, so we have an, an interesting experiment going on with federalism. Uh, in about half the states, uh, if you're a public sector employee, this has to do with public sector unions, even if you don't want to join the union, you can be forced to pay what are called, as you said, agency fees. That's the amount of the union dues that goes towards collective bargaining. It doesn't go towards politicking or election campaigns, that sort of thing, but it goes towards collective bargaining. And the teachers here, there are 10 teachers from California who are suing their union, uh, or the various unions, in Cal teachers' unions in California, uh, saying, look, uh, everything that you are negotiating with the state is a matter of public policy. This isn't simply like in the private sector where it's just wages and, and retirement benefits and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about the amount of money spent on the classroom, whether you're talking about tenure rules versus merit pay, all of these issues have to deal with education policy, the budget. These are public policy matters, and therefore they're the equivalent of political activities or lobbying, and so we should not be forced to pay for that sort of thing. And this, this deals with a 40-year-old president from the Supreme Court that said that you can be charged for collective bargaining, but not for political activities. Right, that's the Abood uh, versus Detroit Board of Education. So that's, your, that, that's right. Yeah. Now, it, it's, um, you know, you're a constitutional expert on this, and, and I kind of put you on the spot, but wh where do you think the the Supreme Court is going to rule on this because the Supreme Court ruled on a bood in 77. This is essentially overturning uh, their own uh, their own case now, isn't it? Well, uh, luckily, first of all, I don't get paid based on how I predict what the Supreme Court <laughs> will do. I don't think anyone can make a living doing that. Uh, but I did attend argument, uh, and uh, it, it looks like I'd rather be us, meaning I filed a brief supporting the teachers here. I'd rather be on that side. Uh, then on the union side, it seemed like there wasn't a, a single justice, or rather there, there were not five votes uh, uh, to support the, the union. That is, the four Democratic appointees could be expected to support the union, but 
uh, no positive signs from the so-called conservatives. Uh, some had been looking to Justice Scalia, actually, as a somewhat unlikely swing justice because uh, in this case, because he had said in the past in private sector union cases that if a state wants to have a law saying that if the employer agrees with the union that you have to join the union or you have to pay these fees, that's uh, freedom of contract. The employer should be able to do that. Uh, but this is a public sector, and it's, and it's different. And, and here Scalia was clearly uh, on the other side. So I'm optimistic about this case, but who knows uh, what the Supreme Court will do. There's always plenty of surprises in June. What do you think the, the ramifications would be if the court rules in favor of the teachers? Well, it means that, like I said, we have this federalism experiment uh, ongoing around the country, and half the states, they don't have these laws. And what happens there is the unions become a lot more responsive to their members. Uh, there's, there's a slight drop in union membership, but, what's, uh, but the union does become more accountable. They're less involved in uh, sending uh, 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 ground troops, essentially, to politic on unrelated matters for unrelated candidates around the country. Uh, and instead, they're really focusing on the concerns of the public sector workers they're meant to protect. What this means is that there are going to be there's going to be less money uh, going into uh, Democratic Party coffers, certainly, uh, and in general, less involvement by unions in political matters that have nothing to do with uh, with labor law. Um, so it's, it do, it definitely will have an important impact, I think, on the political system much more. Uh, than on uh, uh, labor, per se. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things in, in the uh, uh, Cato uh, essay you, uh, you wrote, uh, this surprised me. I'd never read this before, and it talked about the effect of a negative teacher or a, a less-than-average teacher uh, effect on the students and for a lifetime on the students. It affects their income and their effectiveness, their critical thinking, that kind of stuff. I never, I never saw any research like that before. Yeah, this is fairly new, and it started uh, coming out with a uh, California state uh, case lawsuit that was decided last year, throwing out some of the uh, tenure protections and other union rules in the California system as denying uh, an equal education to some of the... Uh, uh, students in the in the more disadvantaged uh, districts in in California, uh, and you can see how this could make sense because if if teachers have absolute tenure and can't be fired, um, and there's no merit pay and uh, things like that, you're not going to get as as high quality uh, education. The laws of supply and demand don't somehow uh, go away in the in the education sector, and so indeed, I think. Uh, with um, uh, teachers that, that, that become more responsive to the needs of the students, um, you could have definitely a, a benefit in educational quality and educational freedom as they're forced to compete with charter schools and others. Yeah, that, that, that was just fascinating research uh, uh, to me. We're talking about how union news and freedom of speech come together with Ilya Shapiro. He's a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute. Uh, got about a minute or two left uh, of your time today. I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Uh, have you um, done any work or, or, or much research on uh, Texas and the, the take care clause going on uh, from that state and the, the executive action of uh, President Obama there? Yeah, you're talking about the immigration lawsuit yes. that was filed by 26 states led by Texas. Yes, Cato, I have been filing briefs in that case uh, on behalf of supporters of immigration reform who think that you actually need to pass a law to change the law, that the president can't uh, do it himself. And the Supreme Court added, once it took up this case, it will be argued in, in April, uh, it, it added the question about not simply whether the president violated the law, whether the, the Department of Homeland Security can implement its new policy, or whether it went through the right procedures in administrative law, but it added the constitutional question of whether the president was violating his duty to take care that the law be faithfully executed. Now, I don't think the ultimate ruling is going to be 
based on the Constitution, on the Take Care Clause, but that's sort of the atmospheric. If the president is, if the executive branch uh, is going beyond its statutory authority, in a sense, it is violating the separation of powers and therefore that, uh, that constitutional duty. So I think this is very important. There's not that much precedent on this. In fact, mm-hmm. only three times as the Supreme Court heard argument on the Take Care Clause. The last time was with Harry Truman's steel seizures in the 50s. Uh, and so that, I think, accentuates the importance of this case. Now, would that have uh, would that have ramifications for President Obama on other executive orders that, that he has cranked out in, in his tenure? Or indeed on future presidents. It, it may. It just depends on how the court um, writes it, its opinion, what kind of standard it sets out for uh, when the president is uh, acting beyond his powers, uh, what the relationship is between legislative action or inaction uh, and executive prerogative. We've been talking with Ilya Shapiro. He's a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute and editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Ilya, I really appreciate you taking time away from your, your brand-new family uh, this evening. And uh, uh, as always, it's a, a real honor and pleasure uh, talking to you. Uh, you going to CPAC by any chance? Are we going to see you at CPAC? Uh, I, I go when I'm invited. So I've spoken a couple of times or done some interviews. So we'll, we'll see what turns out this time. Well, if you show up, I'll, I'll hunt you down so we can meet in person. Once again, thanks so much for your time and uh, hope we can tap you on the shoulder again soon. Sounds good. Take care. Good night. Thanks. I'm Gary Rathman. Listen, he